Hi everyone, it's great to be with you. Um, this is Smith Schools where I just kind of um, started on my ESG journey, although it was not called uh, ESG when I was, was here. Um, the, the nomenclature changes over time, so it's a positive thing. Um, but it's really a pleasure to be here with you all today talking about how to um, build an ESG strategy, uh, how to engage your stakeholders, um, and then really, most importantly, how to bring in your workforce into that strategy as likely your most important stakeholder. Um, so when you're thinking about, um, well, first, actually, uh, I heard a story recently, um, which I thought was interesting. I apologize if you have heard it before, um, but I thought it was relevant to the discussion today. Um, in 1962, when the U.S. was preparing um, for the moon mission, uh, President Kennedy visited NASA and was doing a tour and meeting with a lot of the employees at the space station. And he saw a man with a broom and he walked up to the custodian and said, hi, I'm Jack Kennedy. What do you do here? And the custodian replied, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. And that story is really corny, but I do think that it is emblematic of the opportunity that exists um, to be able to utilize ESG, how, how to help um, associates, employees, um, really find their purpose in an organization and then help to benefit that organization as well. Um, so when you're thinking about how you could utilize ESG to root a company and its purpose and inspire your workforce, it's really important to think about why you're doing what are the reasons that you're actually embarking upon this ESG journey? So at Marriott, um, it, we found it most beneficial to really connect it directly with our business. But <laughs> everything we do from an ESG standpoint um, is not to have our name on a banner or anything like that. It really just is purely tied to our core business. So it's really important when, when thinking about building an ESG strategy to think about um, who are your key stakeholders. Uh, so you may have seen some of these stats. I'm, I'm sure that in this conference, a lot of stats are being thrown at you, but here's the ones that caught my attention recently. Um, There's a really good uh, survey called the Edelman Trust Survey that comes out every year um, that kind of discusses various uh, degrees of, of uh, <coughs> stakeholder trust across the board, including ESG issues. Um, and, one, and some of their findings recently were that 71% of employees view social impact as a strong expectation or deal breaker when selecting a job. Uh, six in 10 choose employers based on their beliefs and have actually left jobs when they felt that their, uh, that their employer either took the wrong stand on an issue or, did, or refused to take a stand at all. And 76% of employees want to stay with their employer, of belief driven employees want to stay with their employers for many years. For a company, a stat like that is gold because it is much more expensive and arduous to train new employees. You want to be able to have your employees stay, have your employees grow, have your employees thrive. So if giving them opportunities to engage on issues they care about, like ESG, can help to accomplish that goal, that's a really positive thing. Investors are also asking about this. About 70 to 80% of institutional investors view ESG as material to their investment analyses. Um, a recent study by PwC just released earlier this year projected that ESG-focused uh, investments are expected to reach $34 trillion in assets uh, by 2026, and that's roughly 21% of total assets under management. So really a, a, a tremendous potential for growth. And 60% of asset managers report that ESG investing is actually um, related to higher results compared to non-ESG uh, investments. And of course, as a, as a business, you're always going to be hyper-concerned about what your customers care about. So again, from the Edelman survey, 64% um, consider themselves to be belief-driven consumers. Uh, that's even more so when you look at uh, consumers under the age of 35. Uh, this is particularly relevant to, to my industry, maybe some others in the room. 89% uh, of global travelers think sustainable travel is important. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about the, the concept of regenerative travel, um, but that's something that in my world we're hearing more and more, this concept of uh, giving more than you take when you visit a, de a destination. Um, but actually making sure that you're doing good in those communities and not just uh, participating in over-tourism and actually denigrating that. 
and then specific to, to Marriott, our business, we have over $5 billion worth of corporate customers that are requiring ESG reporting of some degree. That could be um, that, uh, requiring uh, metrics around how they, about how many, uh, about their carbon emissions. Sorry for the stuttering. I should not have my, uh, my phone in my pocket. I recall. Um, they require ESG reporting like the, the emissions uh, that they uh, emit when they travel with us. Uh, they require uh, metrics on human rights and other things like that. It's becoming really important because many of these corporate customers have sustainability and social impact goals of their own. So it's really important when looking at their entire supply chain, of which we are a part, um, that they are able to trust us and really do business with us and then meet their ESG goals as well. So it is so at Marriott, we took a look at all of those stakeholders um, and more and had a lot of conversations uh, internally, externally, met with community groups, representatives from the investor community, um, business partners, consultants, uh, to really think about what we are going to do as a hospitality company, as the world's largest hospitality company, from a sustainability and social impact perspective. Our goal was really to have a deep impact on, on a few key issues, um, rather than kind of a, a wide but disparate impact. Um, so after a lot of discussions, um, we came up with uh, Serve 360 doing good in every direction. Uh, so this is our overarching ESG strategy. It was really important for us to have uh, a strategy that we could really put uh, a, a stake in the ground around a few key issues that we could tell our workforce, this is what Marriott truly cares about as a company. This is what's material to our business. This is what's material to our communities. This is what's material to our environments. And we also wanted to make sure that from an external standpoint, this made sense. That when we talk about what we're doing from an ESG perspective, which is highly scrutinized, that it really made sense. That this is all directly tied back to our business. Um, but of course, when talking to your associates, you want something that is uh, easily understandable, um, that seems digestible. So that's why we came up with this, uh, with this branding. So again, it's called Serve 360, doing good in every direction. Um, and uh, the strategy follows like the directions of a compass, which we think is appropriate for a travel company. Um, so for North is uh, nurture our world. For South is sustain responsible operations. For East is empower for opportunity. And for West is for welcome all and advance human rights. Um, so I apologize that, the, that it's not coming through clearly on the PowerPoint, um, but under North is nurture our world. Um, and this is advancing the sustainability uh, and resiliency of our communities uh, all around the world. So we have 8,200 hotels right now in over 140 countries. That is a lot of communities. So those are a lot of people that we feel the responsibility that we have to, to take care of to some, to some degree. We have to have that mutual relationship. We want the communities where we have our hotels to be thriving communities that people want to live, work, and visit in. We have a really uh, uh, um, intentional focus on making sure that people want to be in those communities because we want them to be vibrant places to run a business. Um, under uh, South is uh, to sustain responsible operations. And this is our work to reduce uh, our environmental impact across our entire value chain. So this is reducing uh, water, reducing energy, reducing waste, uh, as well as uh, responsible source. So this is something that, we, that was really loud and clear when we were uh, going through these stakeholder interviews about what's important material to our business. Our associates really voiced that this is something that, that they care about. And uh, as I was noting before, this is something externally that is uh, hyper, that people are hyper aware about. Um, in my world, um, as was mentioned before, I look after our ESG reporting. Uh, so that is essentially uh, disclosing what Marriott, um, our, our ESG strategy and our progress, but also kind of where we're falling short and the impacts that we're making on the environment. Uh, so I'm not sure if this has been a, uh, a discussion at all at this conference, um, but the, the SEC is currently considering regulations around how companies report on uh, GHG emissions. So again, this is 
if you are a company that was not focused on this prior and you're having to play catch up, you're not in a great position right now. So we're really happy that in 2017, which is I neglected to mention, um, which is when we developed the strategy um, that we were kind of, uh, I don't want to say ahead of the game, but on, on pace. And then East is for empower throughography. Um, so when I talk about social impact work, uh, the easiest way to describe it, especially to my family, they, they just, they don't understand that I don't work in a hotel, um, <laughs> that I work at our, at our, at our headquarters. Uh, but when I uh, describe social impact work, the easiest way for me to describe it is it's taking a business need as well as a societal or environmental need and bringing them together to try to find a common solution. And that's where I think that this work uh, to empower the opportunity really shines. Uh, we do a lot of work to uh, target groups that have faced historical uh, disadvantages or barriers to education, employment, training, um, and work to uh, develop hospitality skills within those communities. And then we seek to then bring them into our hotels or the larger industry or related industries. We are happy when we can train an individual and have them have a, a, a positive career afterwards. But of course, selfishly, we would love for them to come work for us. And then finally, uh, for West is to welcome all and advance human rights. And this is really our mission to help to foster a safe and inclusive world for travel. Uh, for all people. And that's everything from um, being able to address uh, people from different cultures that come into our hotels, making sure that they have an inclusive stay, making sure that they feel uh, welcome and at home and celebrated, that they never feel uncomfortable. Um, but it's also taking some taking on some darker issues uh, like human trafficking, which is a major issue for the hotel industry, which I can go into in just a second. Um, so that was a high level overview of what we focus on, but now I'll dive a little bit um, into how that, how the strategy comes to life, specifically how we engage our, our workers. Uh, so again, starting with uh, Nurture Our World, um, I mentioned the amount of communities work. Um, that means when a disaster strikes, there's a very high chance that that's going to, that that's going to work. Uh, so we have several funds uh, that we utilize to be able to uh, support our associates in times of need. Uh, if, if there's a natural disaster that could affect the hotel, that could shut the hotel down, the hotel's not operating, that means our associates don't have hours, that means they're not getting paid. Uh, so we work to uh, try to um, utilize our funds so that our associates can have uh, extra funding for food or, or essential supplies or essential supplies or home repairs um, or things like that. Uh, this is also true as far as non-natural disasters. So think about uh, the, the pandemic we did. That, that absolutely decimated our, our industry. Um, logically, you can't, if, if the world shuts down, you're not traveling. If you're not traveling, you're not staying in hotels. If you're not staying in hotels, our business is not great. Um, so that really had a lot of effects on, on our associates. Um, so we, over the, over the course of the pandemic contributed about $2 million to, to our associates to, again, just provide a little bit of relief to help them be able to put food on the table to help them have their have, uh, essential supplies. Um, it's also a humanitarian crisis like the war in Ukraine. Uh, so while we don't actually have a, uh, a big presence in the Ukraine itself, we do have a lot of the Ukrainian associates that work in the countries around Ukraine or throughout Europe or even uh, some in the, in the Middle East. So we used our fund to help uh, our Ukrainian associates get their family members that were still in the Ukraine out of the Ukraine and resettle into the countries where our associates were working and getting them set up with rental assistance, with, with food assistance, oftentimes paying uh, some legal bills that helps with their migration and resettlement, sometimes supporting some, some medical costs. And then our, our associates also uh, really engage in this as well. So over the course of the, uh, the war in Ukraine so far, our hotels uh, in, in the European region have contributed about $3.5 million uh, between in-kind donations and financial support uh, towards those that, are, that have been impacted. Um, and that includes over 18,000 roommates that they have uh, donated to, to Ukrainian refugees. 
Uh, this is also about uh, supporting the, the vitality of, of children. Um, and because I was talking a lot about making sure that your ESG issues are really tied directly into your business, um, you may not think that the vitality of children is directly correlated with the success of a hotel company, um, but this is an example of really listening to your associates and what your associates care about and what they are excited about. Um, so for years, our U.S. associates have uh, fundraised for Children's Miracle Network Hospitals, a really incredible organization. Um, that does a lot of fantastic work for children with cancer. Um, we were actually uh, their first corporate partner when they were just getting started. Uh, so our associates, uh, since that relationship started about 40 years ago, um, have raised over $140 million for CMA. So as we were thinking about our ESG strategy, we wanted to make sure um, that our associates still had something that, they really, that really pulled on their heartstrings and that they cared about. Um, when we were developing the strategy, our CEO at the time said, this is all wonderful that you're tying into our business, but remember to not kill the joy, uh, to still keep that, uh, to keep that beating and make sure that people are excited about this. So that's what we focus on in the U.S. and Canada. Um, but you might remember in uh, 2016, um, we announced that we were merging with Starwood uh, Hotels and Resorts. So that's the company that ran uh, brands like Weston. Uh, St. Regis, uh, Sheraton, Element, um, some other brands that you may be familiar with. Um, so when we were going through that merger, we really were looking at taking the best of uh, both worlds, both companies, and that includes from an ESG perspective. Uh, so Starwood had a longstanding relationship with UNICEF, a really incredible global uh, children's organization. Uh, so we decided that we were going to bring on the UNICEF partnership as well to kind of be the, the international counterpart to what we're doing in the U.S. and Canada uh, with Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. And we're working on a program right now um, that we hope to launch early next year um, that uh, allows our guests traveling through uh, properties in hotels outside of the U.S. and Canada um, to be able to contribute to UNICEF while they, while they stay with us. Um, and I also would like to mention that when you're, when you're thinking about engaging your associates or your workforce, you really need to create resources that will help them make an impact. Uh, the, the, the associates that work in our hotels uh, are really caring and spirited and passionate individuals that want to be able to give back to their communities, um, but they often don't have the, the time to be able to figure out how to do so. So it's on our team to really think about how we can create turnkey resources that really make this as easy as possible. Um, so one of our goals that we seek to uh, achieve by 2025 is to contribute 15 million hours of volunteers. Um, during the pandemic, you might imagine volunteering, quite difficult. Uh, those big numbers are oftentimes coming from uh, things like food packing events, big outdoor activities, group activities. That becomes a lot harder when you're blocking your home. Uh, so we developed a, uh, a resource that helps our associates be able to uh, set up virtual volunteerism opportunities and the things that they could do directly from their hotels or in their home offices. If, 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 uh, if that. Uh, so for sustaining responsible operations, um, it's this is only possible if we're really engaging our associates in creating um, a culture of sustainability. This is not just the, the engineers working on sustainability, on reducing our energy, water, waste. Uh, it's our, um, it's the people that work in our restaurants and bars thinking about how they can creatively um, reduce food waste, how they can use food that would have otherwise gone to waste um, in their meals, in their uh, cocktails. It's the housekeepers making sure that if a guest um, keeps their towel on the rack, that they indeed don't wash it, that they respect the, the, the guest wishes and, and save that water. It's about every person in the hotel really knowing, and if you're in a different business, and every person in your business really thinking about how can I embed sustainability into my everyday work. Um, and just some, some uh, notable announcements that we've made uh, in, the, in the recent past. Uh, we announced uh, that we're going to go net zero by 2050. So that means that we're going to um, reach uh, net zero carbon, carbon emissions um, and set a science-based target. Uh, we've also, uh, several years ago, announced our ambition to remove plastic straws 
um, from uh, all of our uh, restaurants and bars. Um, and we're also moving uh, away from the, the tiny bottles that you've classically seen in hotels uh, towards uh, residential style uh, pump top dispensers. Um, that has been very transparently a, uh, a controversial one that the, the tiny bottles have been so synonymous um, with the hotel industry. Uh, but really, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from them. They are um, they're better for our owners that actually own our hotels. Um, they are better for the environment. I think it makes for the better guest experience. I personally uh, would rather have uh, a pump top um, uh, dispenser and know that I have enough rather than running out of it uh, mid, mid shower. Um, so we've really seen a lot of success uh, from it. And most importantly, we've seen tons and tons of, of plastic uh, waste reduced. Um, so again, under Empower for Opportunity, this is work that I'm really excited about uh, to, to train, uh, again, groups that have faced those historical barriers in hospitality skills. Um, we recently uh, announced a goal in the U.S. to hire 1,500 refugees uh, in the U.S. by 2025. Now, that might not sound like a huge number uh, for a company at the size of Marriott scale, uh, but if you are not familiar with our with uh, how the hospitality industry runs, we don't really own any of our hotels. It's very much like a like a McDonald's. You're you're franchising these hotels out, so the hotels. Um, essentially acquire the rights to be able to have our brand standards, have our name, have our logo, have our reputation and our halo effect. Um, but then they're running those hotels. So our direct influence uh, is somewhat limited. So to make a, a goal like hiring 1,500 refugees in the U.S. by 2025 means that we're going to have to do a lot of stakeholder engagement and relationship building um, with these hotels. We can't just tell them hire a, a refugee. It's, it's just not that simple. Um, so what we are doing is, we began this work several years ago, beginning with training. So we partnered with the International Rescue Committee, which is just a fantastic uh, humanitarian organization uh, that supports refugees around the world. Um, and with them, we developed the Hospitality Link Program. So we uh, worked to uh, train refugees that had recently resettled in the U.S. Uh, in hospitality skills. We had them um, come to Pelican hotels for hotel tours. Uh, our general managers and other associates at the hotels became mentors for the refugees. The hotels were involved with developing the curriculum. So it was really an incredible partnership um, that we've run uh, for, for several years. And um, we're actually on pace to uh, train 270 refugees to the program just this year alone. Um, but again, we wanted to, to take that infrastructure that we were laying and really, um, and really take it to the next level through hiring. Uh, so we worked to um, match up to identify key cities uh, where there are high populations of refugees, where we also have a lot of job openings. So coming out of the pandemic, many people are struggling with, um, with proper staffing in their businesses. Um, the hotel industry is, is certainly uh, among them, if not uh, one of the most effective. So we have a lot of areas right now that where we have hotels that are not fully staffed. So we've worked with the IRC to identify areas where there are high populations of refugees, but we also have a lot of available jobs and really match them up. So over the past year, we identified 15 of those markets and we worked with, um, we created relationships between the local IRC offices and our local hotels. Uh, we created a dedicated tracking link where a refugee can apply through that link. And then the hiring managers at our hotels are able to see that they're coming as uh, that they're coming from the IRC and they can have that in their slate of considerations when they're reviewing companies. And then we also follow up with the hotels directly and say, hey, if you didn't see this, X number of refugees have applied to Y positions. Just make sure that you give them proper consideration when going through your, your hiring process. Um, so we're looking forward to getting results from that pilot uh, early next year. I hope to be able to, to, to share some, some positive results. Um, but even ahead of finishing the pilot, um, we knew that if we were going to achieve our 1,500 um, refugee hire goal by 2025, we really needed to, to scale this. Uh, so we partnered with another organization uh, called the Tent Partnership for Refugees, which has relationships with all of the major refugee service providers across the U.S. to kind of do the same thing, but with more partners. 
So we identified 16 more markets where we're setting up those local relationships as well. So we've got a lot of local relationships being set up throughout the country. Um, and we're, we're really hoping this is able to, to make a positive impact on, on these refugees' lives. Um, but it's also about working with our hotels to uh, make sure that they are um, ensuring the diversity of their supply chain. That's a major way that businesses can engage on these issues as well. We have goals around um, what we do with, uh, with, uh, with procurement from women-owned businesses, um, uh, diverse-owned businesses, LGBTQ-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses. We have a multi-billion dollar supply chain. So being able to bring those populations into our business from that perspective also has a, a massive opportunity. And again, I mentioned uh, guest uh, inclusivity. So our associates um, are, are custom trained on how to serve all cultures. Um, our team, my, my boss actually goes out to our hotels and, uh, and runs sessions on how to host an Indian wedding, how to host a Jewish wedding, how to make sure that every culture that could come into our hotel um, is properly uh, respected and so. Um, and then finally, uh, I mentioned before uh, the issue of human trafficking. Um, this is one of the, the darker issues. Uh, it's certainly an issue that the hotel industry um, was not terribly keen uh, to, to talk about for a lot of years. When you think about an instance of human trafficking, fortunately, hotels can be unwilling participants uh, in, in that. Um, but in 2016, we decided that we weren't just going to have our heads in the sand uh, about this issue and that we are going to take it head on. So we partnered uh, with two leading human rights nonprofits uh, called Pat USA and, and Flaris uh, to develop a custom human trafficking awareness training uh, that we could uh, give to the associates that work in our hotels. So we set a goal that we were going to uh, have 100% of our on-property associates trained in human trafficking awareness by 2025. Uh, not only did we create that training, um, we donated it to the hospitality industry more broadly. So if you so even if you don't work for Marriott, you can have access to our training and make sure that you know how to recognize and respond to the science of human trafficking uh, in our in, in hotels or really anywhere. Uh, we also do a lot of work to create um, guest facing and associate uh, facing posters that we can hang that emphasize the training and, and show some of the signs of, of human trafficking. Uh, these aren't things that should be taken just like one off or if you see one sign, then it's definitely a sign of human trafficking. But if you see a combination of these signs together in a hotel, um, it, it gives instructions for how you can escalate that either to a manager or by calling the National uh, Human Trafficking Awareness Hotline. Um, we, as I said, we have a we have a goal to train 100% of these associates, uh, all property associates, by 2025, and we're at 70 about 73% right now, um, which we're we're pretty proud of, especially for a, a workforce of our size and scale. And that's something that we know we're never going to fully achieve. That at no moment in time are we ever going to really say that 100% of associates are trained because we have constant turnover. But that's not really. It's about having that aspirational goal that we can always say that we're working towards and show meaningful progress um, because it really is a priority for the company. Um, where I was talking before about uh, skills uh, building programs, we partnered with, a, with an organization called the, the Global Fund to, uh, to end modern slavery. Um, and that kind of takes that similar approach, but, sur but for survivors of human trafficking. Survivors really face uh, an absolutely tough road. So we're really proud to be able to provide some skills training for them as well. Um, we just piloted our first uh, cohort to train 64 uh, participants, and we just had our first hire um, into one of our hotels, which we're super excited about. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, the larger industry has the opportunity to take our training. Um, and over set of, actually, we just got updated numbers over 830,000 hotel workers, not from Marriott, have, have taken our training, which we're super excited about. And there were 950,000 uh, Marriott associates sent the training. Um, and just a couple of stats here um, that I that I want to show that um, from some results from our ESG programming. Um, 86% of married associates uh, say that they believe the company has a commitment to sustainability. 89% um, believe that the company has a strong commitment to social impact. You might say, okay, these aren't in the 90s. Is this really something to put up on the screen? 
Um, and it's a fair, it's a fair thought. Uh, but as I mentioned before, we just came out of the hardest time that the, our industry has ever faced. Uh, the pandemic was worse than 9-11 and the 2008 financial crisis combined uh, for us. Our revenues absolutely dropped. Uh, we uh, laid off about half of our corporate workforce. Um, our hotels had to unfortunately uh, release a lot of their associates and the ones that came back are still starving. So the fact that post all of that, from our ESG programming, we're able to put up numbers like 86% and 89% is quite impressive. Uh, we've also had over 15,000 associates uh, sign up uh, to say that I want to be a sustainability or social impact champion uh, at their hotel, which is something we're also really, really proud of. So that's my shtick. Um, I, I really appreciate you guys having me. Um, I really, really believe um, in the ESG, I feel really fortunate that I was able to uh, begin uh, studying this um, when I was at school here, and that I have uh, built my career doing this first as a consultant, now working for for, for Marriott for the past seven years. Um, and I'm really grateful to be able to talk to you all about it today. And um, I have to stop and take any questions. Um, Kristen Fallon, GE, thank you for this. I actually stayed in the Marriott in Times Square and thank there was a trafficking uh, tips or you know, how to spot it in the mm -hmm. elevator and it, it actually was very striking to me and I said, wow, that's so cool. And it stuck with me. So I'm, I'm like now an advocate for this. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, so um, <clears throat> I'm curious, it's a two-part question sure. actually, but how do you, the, the data you just showed is cool and inspiring. Are you guys actually measuring ROI on this? And if you're not, like, how do you ensure you're, you continue to get funding for this? Sure. Right. Because at some point, there's a CFO asking, like, why yeah. am I investing in this? Especially probably coming out of the pandemic. Absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can measure ROI. The thing about ESG, just like you think of anything more broad than environmental, social, and governance, this is so massive. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that we can measure success. So from a environmental sustainability standpoint, after a few years of investments in the, on the hotel level, you really do start to see that ROI. When you um, are able to implement uh, sustainable practices, your utility costs, which in hotels are about the second highest cost, definitely see, you, see to, um, you see them start to go down year, year over year. Um, the, the number I showed before, over $5 billion worth of corporate customers, that in itself is a massive piece of, of uh, a data point for ROI because that number goes down if, we, if we're not investing in our ESG practices. We have had hotels lose business because they are not up to snuff with, um, with um, our customers' environmental or human rights practices. Not because we don't have the, the, the strategy and the program essentially, but just because that hotel hadn't adopted it. But that's a really great piece of information that we can use to, to drive home the importance of this. When a hotel either is interested or an owner is interested, we're able to materially say, your customers are caring about this, they're losing business because it's not there. Um, so we have a lot of tools uh, that we operate centrally to be able to, able to capture environmental uh, and social data. And we feed that into uh, the RFP that our hotels respond to. So when someone issues an RFP for an event and the hotel essentially bids for it, we're able to feed our data into that process so they make sure that so they can be best uh, set up for, for success. Um, kind of some non-financial ROI uh, for the human trafficking training. We collect, we definitely collect stories of, um, of some of our uh, successes. It's weird to say successes because it was, a, it was a, an instance of human trafficking. But we have stories of our associates saving someone's life because they followed our training. Um, and actually, pretty soon, we're going to be releasing a, a video, which I'd be happy to share with you, um, that has some of our associates talking about uh, their personal stories about how they use their training uh, to, to intervene um, and, and stop the innocence of what you found. So I hope that addresses some, mm -hmm. some of your questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm curious, you touched on it a little bit, but how ESG strategy implementation works in like with the franchise model? Yeah, so it is um, kind of twofold. There is the stuff that we can mandate, and there is the stuff that we can encourage. Um, things that we mandate are our uh, commitment to uh, reducing our environmental impact. 
So the things that go around um, producing energy, producing water, producing waste, we've built those into brand standards. So now if you decide to, if you're a franchisee and you want to do business with Marriott, while you're paying for the brand standards of getting to have that red M on your hotel and, and whatnot, this is also part of it, is, is, is operating in a way that you're working towards our environmental uh, goals, um, which now have gotten even more ambitious as we've worked uh, to go uh, net zero by 2050. But even before that, we have substantial um, goals around reducing our energy, water, uh, and waste. Uh, same thing for human trafficking. Our, uh, our human trafficking awareness training is a mandatory training. It was actually the first training um, that Marriott has ever made mandatory that wasn't direct, uh, like service and operations related training. So it really does show our, our, our commitment to it. Uh, the other stuff is kind of building that business case um, about why this can benefit your business and of course the world as well. And it is about um, creating those resources that make it as easy as possible. Um, so for instance, from kind of like a, maybe a more like social perspective, uh, we have guides, I, I mentioned the, the, the guide that we came out with during the pandemic, but we just came out with a new one um, for hotels that want to volunteer in their communities. But we really just show it like one, two, three, four, five, here's what you need to think about when uh, setting up uh, a nonprofit partnership locally here on a national level, on a local level, here's pre vetted organizations uh, that you can take a look at. Even if they're not these organizations, try to find organizations like them. It's really just making it as, as easy as possible. And it's also that um, that relationship building as well. It's spending some time with, with franchise management companies, uh, communicating in their language, uh, and really just encouraging them to, to participate, but always showing how this is, at the end of the day, going to benefit the business. Because that's, that's why they're doing business with Marriott in the first place. Yes. Eric, thank you. Really great to get this kind of update from, from you. Uh, I guess I'm wondering, Okay, 8,200 properties, this huge kind of tanker that you have to steer at the corporate level. It feels like some of the goals are small, important, obviously, plastic straws, what have you. Yep. Net zero, that's big. Um, but it also feels like 2050 is a long way away. So how do you kind of sequence that? Or, I'm just thinking, you know, you might be able to get to net zero in France. Uh, you know, tomorrow, it might take a long time to get to net zero in some place that has, you know, a, a really heavy reliance on coal. Or something. So yeah. I'm just, how do you like kind of build that, given that it's 8,200 properties and you have to do it one property at a time, how do you kind of build that out so it's not like people, I, I can imagine a lot of people saying, 2050, why do we have to wait until 2050 to be net zero? Right. Uh, some people did say that. You're, <laughs> you're certainly correct, um, which is why if I would have my my uh, PR colleague next to me, she would say, "No later than 2050." <laughs> that's, that's, that's the wording that, that we very specifically use. Um, you're right. It, it is. It is. Uh, some people will say, "How how are you going to get there by 2050?" Other people will say, "Why is it taking so long?" Um, and it's taking so long because kind of how you you set it up. It might be easy some places. Easy is relative. It might be uh, achievable in the next 15 years in some places. In some places, it will not. Like I said, we have 8,200 hotels now, and we're certainly not stopping. So that's we used to measure our current um, goals for energy, water, and waste reduction are about um, intensity, which is essentially like efficiency per per person per room. Because so we're not going to stop growing. Like our, our our business is certainly incentivized to continue to add hotels. That's also part of why it needs to be. Figuring out how can we have sustainable development from adding hotels perspective while, out, while also making that development sustainable from an environmental perspective. So it's about um, increasing the sustainable response of uh, the sustainable operations in the hotel, making sure that they're reducing their water, energy, waste, et cetera, uh, properly, while also looking at other paths um, like carbon offsets and things like that. So there's a lot of discussion around carbon offsets. I'm not sure how familiar you are with them, essentially funding projects that help to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Um, they are sometimes uh, not highly uh, regarded, um, but they are important. They're really important to, to be able to, to fund. So it's factoring that in as well. Um, we are never going to uh, write a check uh, to 
in the amount to be able to offset our progress, but it's looking at all of the different levers that we can pull to really make uh, this holistic impact. Um, so I don't have a, a direct answer today because we're still developing. We're, we're, we're working with consultants to figure out how exactly we do this. And it's something that I was actually proud of that the company was able to say, we're gonna say we're gonna do this before we fully know how. That is very counter to business in general, especially Marriott. It's very conservative culture, not politically, but like, but as far as how we're willing to like stick our necks out. Um, we are not big uh, chest thumpers. We don't tend to say, claim anything, say anything before we have like full backup um, in a in a very uh, laid out, buttoned up plan. Um, but this is something that we do think is important enough. Uh, that we were willing to put a stake on the ground before we have it fully, fully figured out. Um, but it's going to be a multi-pronged strategy um, that is both actively trying to remove carbon from the atmosphere and offset that way, while at the same time bringing down um, the environmental impact that we make in our hotels and our supply chains. We have time for one more question. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Please. Okay. I wasn't sure if anyone else raised my hand prior, but um, so my, you know, this is kind of a contradicting. So you're kind of portraying your ESG to, you know, external, but my role is portraying ESG to corporate customers like you, and we're doing more on the water treatment side, you know, trying to meet those goals. What type of technologies, I guess, are you prioritizing from an environmental standpoint? It doesn't have to be just the water, because we're also the energy side of it. Um, I guess more so the realm. What are you seeing as emerging in that area? That's your prioritizing. Whether it's technologies or just strategies in general to this franchise. So I can say at a very high level that we have like a global water strategy of a certain amount of percentage that we're looking to reduce by 2025, but we know that that's going to look different in our in in depending on what our take look at. It's definitely a global strategy that is implemented globally. Um, but I'll I'll have to be honest and say I I sit on our social impact team. We have a dedicated sustainability team that is able to give you more in-depth uh, answers to that. So I just don't want to speak ignorantly. I'm yeah, uh, giving you something it. false, but I'd be happy to connect you with it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll reach out to you then. Right Maybe because I kind of whipped that one, we could get one more in. Yeah. No, I've already asked. Please. I had a follow-up to the question about number of sites. So work for an international construction company, thousands of sites across the US every day. Uh, we are not as far along in the journey that, that you are. We may be on the S and G side, on the S side we certainly are, but on the environmental side, uh, we are trying to figure out how to collect data, uh, and, like which systems to use, and how to establish basically baselines yeah. or measurements. Have you been? I assume you're, you're collecting a ton of data. What, what kind of systems are you guys using to do that? Or any suggestions on where we should go for? Sure. So it took us years and years to be able to get a centralized system that all of our properties managed and franchised in every country can, can be on. Um, but it's really what you need to do if you're going to properly measure this. Um, and then as well set, uh, like, what is a, a reasonable baseline that is uh, authentic to our current operations and where we're, and where we're um, so uh, we use Schneider Electric. They are a, a, a great vendor, and they've set up our uh, a custom system that our, all of our uh, hotels report their energy, water, and waste data into, both qualitative and uh, and quantity. So you're doing that on the operations side. Are you doing that on the built side as well? It's a lot of properties. So it's a lot of yeah. We need to. Uh, so I I knew that I knew that our hotels. Carbon emission and the uh, life cycle of the project is in the phase before it even becomes out uh, occupied. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say, while I can't see that in certainty, because we have to look at scope one, two, and three yeah. emissions, so not just what we directly emit, but it's also from what we purchase and what's indirectly in our supply chain, um, I would imagine that, that would be included in that as well. But I'd be happy to, again, connect to this. Yeah, I love more. Next 